Welcome to Run With It, the show that brings you untapped business ideas from successful entrepreneurs. My name is Chris Justin, and I'm here with Ethan Janney. Ethan, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. I just got a chance to visit a more uh, rural setting than I'm typically in and you know, sit amongst some flowers and gardens. And I wish I, I need to have a country home <laughs> to complement <laughs> my, uh, my suburban house near the highway. <laughs> Yeah, we are. Well, you're outnumbered by Yinzers on the call today. Uh-oh. We've got Kenny Gould with us. Tell us a little bit about Kenny. Yeah, I'll tell you a bit about Kenny. He's an old friend. Um, I got a lot to say about him being fellow Yinzers. I'm a Yinzer too, you know. I you just didn't know it. Um, we go way back, me and Kenny. Uh, we drink beer together a lot because uh, he's. Uh, you know, he and I are raging alcoholics. Um, we have a lot of fun. With <laughs> um, as the he's the current he's the current. This none of this is true, guys. As the current creative director of uh, at Next Glass, um, and this is the company that actually bought his business, Hop Culture. He's working on the Untapped Beer Festival currently. That's spelled U N T A P P D, which happens at the Padres Stadium in San Diego. And it will be in October 2021. Um, you could just Google Untapped Beer Festival and find some stuff out about that. But uh, today he wants to talk about writing and language and an idea around that. Yeah, this is one of those ideas I'm really excited about. It, one of the things that I love most about this podcast is to uh, learn something new about something that I thought was not possible or is not anywhere close to happening. Kenny's bringing us this idea related to having artificial intelligence create content. And my simplistic mind, as of a week ago, I thought that this was just well far off, not going to happen anytime soon. Turns out that's not the case. Turns out that it's happening right now with a lot of newsrooms. It's happening with uh, even some novel writing. Kenny, tell us a little bit more about the idea here One angle that you took on it, just to state it plainly, is uh, use computers to write romance novels, for example. What made you come up with this idea? All right. So I was living in New York City, where I had moved after starting my company, Hop Culture. It took off very quickly, and I wanted to grow it. So I moved to where media was hot. So I was living in New York City, running this company, digital beer magazine called Hop Culture, And I had discovered that in addition to myself, all of our interns and employees were very interested in fantasy novels. We all loved to read. And so at lunch and stuff, we would be talking about the books we were reading. And eventually we started uh, the Secret Hop Culture Fantasy Book Club. And every six weeks, we would go down to Ivan Ramen on the Lower East Side and we would meet for ramen and to talk about uh, books. And one time I invited the author of the book we were reading to come join us because he was in Philly, which isn't so far from the the big city. And his name was Josiah Bancroft, wrote an awesome book called Senlin Ascends. And uh, I got an opportunity to talk to Josiah before we met up with the group. And he told me that he was a former poet who got tired of writing stuff that nobody was reading. And he said, I'm going to write the most commercial thing possible. And the result was what most people who know the name Josiah Bancroft now know. It was this incredible fantasy book called Senlin Ascends. Um, and that conversation was was real pivotal uh, for me because it got me thinking about my own trajectory in my own career as a writer, thinking, um, I mean, how much stuff do I write that that nobody reads? And is there a way to write more efficiently and uh, write more in a more targeted fashion? Um, and the romance piece came in because uh, I recently learned that of all the genres of books that are sold on Amazon, romance is number one. That's it, the, that story's funny on many levels. One, I imagine Josiah being almost bitter toward you for liking his his commercial <laughs> novel, like not his original vision for the type of work that he wanted to do. He's like, "Yeah, I 
I pretty much sold out and that's what you know made it big. And you're like, I love your novel, man. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> So now, that, Josiah, that, he's he's a real chill dude. Um, but I also think, you know, when I tell people this story, I make the point that the novel is so poetic. It's beautiful. It's lyrically written. The world building's incredible. The scenes that he's able to build through language are insane. And so he didn't really sold out, sell out. He thought he was selling out. But if you read the book, it's one of the most literary fantasy novels I've ever read. There's no way it would be possible for Josiah to sell out. I guess unless he, you know, leveraged the fiction brand he built to sell soap or something. But just because of who he is and and the voice that he's developed as a writer, I don't when I read that book, it's poetry, but it's commercially successful poetry. So I think he he won the game. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, let's tell us about this idea Keep going on the story, I should say. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a writer with a with a day job. I think most writers probably are. Uh, I just read this morning, actually, that 80% of writers who have books published on Amazon are making less than $6,000 a year from their work. So just because of those numbers, you kind of have to have something else that you're doing. And so... I sold my company in November and uh, joined the parent company that bought mine um, as creative director, which has been really cool. But it it kind of got me, th- this story with, with Josiah and just having a little more time now that I'm not running my own company, kind of got me thinking about my own writing. And so I was just curious, you know, how many things have I written in my life that just don't go anywhere? They just sit on my computer because they don't, have an audience? And what if there were ways to know that somebody was interested in your work before you took however long you're going to take to write a book about it? Looking down the line, what if you could even use technology tools to help you through that process? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I um, talk about Cal Newport a lot on this podcast. I'm a huge fan of his work. And surprisingly, even though he does nothing in fiction, he talks often about how he would approach writing fiction. A lot of his listeners are aspiring authors and they always ask him questions. How would you do this? And his piece of advice is often, you should not just go and hole up and write for an hour every morning. That's kind of the romanticized notion of what you're supposed to do. And people who do that, they just, they're creating art. Maybe it's a hobby for them, but it's not going to translate into a book that's ending on the shelves. It's not actually the path to success. So it makes a lot more sense to be more strategic about it and to think about, okay, successful fiction authors, what are the things that they did outside of the practice of writing itself to know what to write about, how to approach the audience, the the themes to focus on. And that's exactly what you're getting at here is maybe you, you use tools like this, like AI to steer your content or give you some ideas but things just outside of the practice of of sitting down at a desk at writing. I I think you hit the nail on the head there. That's exactly what I'm driving at. I think something as simple as keyword research, right? Like if you were going to go publish a blog post or a magazine article for a digital publication, you would do SEO research to figure out how your piece might place before you would go ahead and take the time and energy and pay a writer and spend the time editing and formatting and getting pictures. You know, you'd figure out where there are holes in the internet that you can fill with content. That's the very beginning of of this idea, right? It's uh, that's the low hanging fruit here. And I think the end result is actually humans and AI working hand in hand to produce content. I think we're a ways off from there, but it's coming. It's totally coming. That's a good jumping off point to talk a little bit about the lay of the land here. I thought that we were a ways off from there too, before doing some research. I no longer think that in preparing for this episode. For example, the New York Times uses AI to help create a lot of their articles. I was blown away by that. That's like the most prestigious news organization in the world is currently using AI and complementing it with their writers to create uh, to create some of their content. 
This is often, most often used in sports reporting, especially local sports news. It's comparatively easy to feed in a baseball player's stats. For example, the number of hits, the result of those hits, right? Their yearly batting average, whatever. Feed that all in and AI does a surprisingly decent job of creating a lead-in for an article or even just a little blurb for you know the box scores. And if you're doing that nightly, saves New York Times a lot of time. The Washington Post is also doing this. They have an in-house team that's doing the exact same thing for uh, for sports writing. So at least on that level, it's happening. And more concretely with w- the example that you are bringing us here for uh, romance novels, people are doing this in sci-fi. There's a website, I think, booksbyai.com. It's completely done by artificial intelligence. Everything from the title, the author, the cover art, the reviews, the selected reviews are kind of they're, they're fake reviews, but they are ones that have been made by AI. Even the pricing is uh, generated by AI. They're scraping all this Amazon data and, and coming up with a price. If you look at the the, uh, the artwork and, and the titles and everything like that itself, I'll, I'll share some examples here. Hell of the Seer by Bornander Halmond for eleven sixty nine. It looks like something that maybe... <laughs> Uh, Van Gogh would create the uh, the artwork, uh, not not as good as him, of course, but it's uh, Van Gogh esque. I certainly would not pick up this book just looking at the cover of it. I can't imagine many people are buying this and reading it, but it is awkwardly readable. I'm going to read you the blurb for "The Imperfect in the Disaster" by Bereist Wolf. This year's best known for us in modern million copies. Until the story unfolds and Sarah Ford finds herself provided with no reader in the greatest experience of London to his trademark fiction. So it's stuff like that, which (laughs) seems like it's far off, admittedly. But I picture in five years, it's not going to be. It's going to be creating content that's better than most writers. One of the things that this all reminds me of is, you know, I, I went to music school, studied jazz piano performance, and... There was this transitional period where we started to be able to have recordings. This is kind of hard to fathom at this point in time, but started to have like a recording of something that wasn't on a record or a CD or a tape, and you could actually maybe play at half speed, right? So jazz musicians, what they'll do it traditionally is they'll listen to music and they'll try to play along with it or transcribe it, like write it out as a way of learning how to play the genre. And back in the day, like somebody like John Coltrane, they act, they actually did have the capability to, I believe, take a record player and play it at half speed or something, right? But it would be an octave lower, you know, and it would mess with things. And like nowadays, it could be at the same pitch, right? Like you don't have to sacrifice much. There's a lot of technologies that can make things work. So what I ran into in, in music school was... I had this rub, like it was, it almost felt like an ethical conundrum. Like, should I use the technology to get better as a musician because it's available? Or should I use the traditional methods to kind of be more authentic and like do it the quote unquote right way? And the more I've seen the music industry evolve over the years, the more I see it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot if you if you kind of resist the new technologies available sort of in the name of quote unquote ethics or purity, because they're just going to start being there and people are going to start doing creative things with the new technologies. And the the real space is in using the new technologies in a new and creative way. And and that's the direction that. Well, it's not even so for the music example, it's not even in that much of a creative way. Pretty much every artist nowadays uses auto tune. If you don't use auto tune, you sound Markedly worse than Kesha or Katy Perry or all these other artists. There still is a market for the type of musician that can sing on demand and sound good or can play an instrument live without a click track. You know, there, there's a market for that. Yeah. I think these tools are, it goes back to the argument or, or the friendly discussion that Josiah Bancroft was having with himself. Did I sell out? Did I sell out by making something commercial? Sure. Maybe he has that feeling, but 
to everyone else, it doesn't look like he sold out. It looks like he took what was available at the time and made a decision for himself. And that's at least where I hope this technology will go. Yeah, that's a perfect segue for how we turn this opportunity into a business in some fashion. You, you shared one example of writing romance novels. A million ways to crack this. I do think that it's worth underscoring that the technology is probably not ready in, like right now to just spit out a romance novel. But that's also why it's an opportunity for someone who gets into it at this point. Maybe two years down the line, it will be ready and you will have had the experience to... Uh, to be able to capitalize on it. Ah, yes. Uh, that is why I picked the romance novel, I think, is because uh, you start looking at sales numbers for romance novels on Amazon, and it's going to blow your mind. You're going to be like, who, who is reading all of this? And yet, it is the most popular genre on Amazon. And there are authors you've never heard of that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars in passive income on steamy erotica that probably isn't even published under their real names. It's incredible. And, and in some senses, there's like boil, there's a lot of boilerplate goes into those type of novels, Certainly. right? So like you could use AI to analyze, you know, throw it a bunch of texts, you know, and it's going to figure out what comes back again and again and again. The word, <laughs> the word staff, I think will be, um, Used prominently. Used <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. I, so I think if we want this technology to get better and we want a minimum viable product, start where the money is. There's a program out there right now called GPT-3. Stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer 3. It was created by a San Francisco-based AI research lab uh, called OpenAI. And... It was described in a July 2020 review in the New York Times as amazing, spooky, humbling, and also more than a little terrifying. And I think that just went into beta, I believe, the third version of this. And that's where the potential lies. Right now, to use that, the computing power required to use that generative language learning model is outrageous. But that's how innovations always develop, right? The first version is very expensive and very big. When they made the first computers, they were very expensive and fit in a warehouse. And then they were less expensive and fit in a room. And now I have one in my pocket with more computing power than the first satellites that went up. Um, so I think, Chris, your time estimation, five years, I would take the under. If uh, Ethan, if you want to take over, we can have ourselves a little bet and you can buy me a beer you, in five years. You got to keep me right <laughs> to five years? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you're probably right. I said uh, five years and maybe I'm a little conservative with that. OpenAI has released, I believe, a light version of GPT-3 that everyone can use. They are afraid of putting the, the full version out there. The entire thing about OpenAI is... They wanted to. They realized that AI is going to potentially take over the world if you don't. If you just let it go out there unfettered, so they wanted to be at the forefront of developing it. And I think this is similar to Neuralink's mission. Elon Musk is involved in both. They wanted to be at the forefront of developing it so they could steer it in a way that is not going to have the paperclip problem, where you tell AI to maximize paperclip consumption and then ends up uh, killing all humans in order to to make as many paper clips as possible. The off-sided anecdote for that. GPT-3, you can use this. I believe there's a light version out there that you can use. If not GPT-3, there are examples. Um, I'm looking at this, this guide, an easy guide to deep writing without writing any code. It's a five-minute read. It came out back in uh, 2016, but you can use open source code from GitHub, different models, probably not as good as GPT-3, but you can anyone can can take this, uh, use the training models already existed, and start creating written content using it. Right now, the publishing industry is run by five major players. I think that technology has already opened up the playing field 
in that you can self-publish and have a really successful career as a self-publisher through Kindle Direct Publishing or Ingram Spark, or there's a, a couple different platforms that you can use. And that's that's in the last 10 years. Um, I remember I worked actually at a, I interned at a publishing house in college um, at Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill, which is a super cool publisher. They did Water for Elephants, if you remember that book. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I remember working there and talking to my boss at the time who, who just retired about ebooks and what they were going to do to the industry. And so I think it's only been in the last few years that that technology has made self-publishing an option and really taken down a lot of the traditional barriers to get into the industry. But I think the key and, and what we're talking about here is, is how do we keep going and how do we continue integrating technology and, and AI and data into this very traditional industry. And there are, are tools out there now. Uh, Publisher Rocket is one of them that comes to mind that allows you to scrape Amazon data to figure out how many people are organically searching different Amazon book queries. And then it will also tell you how likely you are to be able to rank on the first page with those keywords. It'll tell you what books are also using those keywords and you can check them out and look at you know what they're doing. So it's a really interesting tool and that's something you can go download and use today. So the holy grail here, I think, is similar to what's already been accomplished is to have a, a computer that can be the grandmaster at chess, right? It's like to have AI fully uh, develop, write, publish, market a book that actually outperforms, you know, sort of the best books by individuals of the year. Again, by this point, a lot of people who are even writing their own quote unquote work are using technology in all sorts of ways to amplify their ability to do what they do. I had an interesting model that we might try. And the reason I, I would do it is because people are just excited about AI right now. And I feel like almost anybody who's in any field is willing to pay, you know, 10, 50, 100 bucks for even a free, you know, for a, you know, a small trial or, you know, try it for a few months or whatever of the AI to help them do what they already do, whether it's marketing or writing. I think a good model is to create one of these services where people do have a paid for service to write and publish the book, you know, or to write and publish something, or sorry, to write something. Okay. And it's just going to say, Hey, we'll help you use AI to like make a cool novel. You will go from as simple to complex as you want, you know, if you want, or, you know, if you want to dive deeper, if you're like a really artisan writer and you want to take some of the stupid sentences that we've got right here and make them better, then you could do that. But you, you use our service, whatever monthly fee, but then there's actually another side where you can get into the publishing and marketing industry where you say, hey, if you don't want to just pay for our service, we'll give you the next level, right? We'll give you the next level. We'll give you like editorial um, review of what you've written and, you know, marketing um, ideas about how to, you know, write it so that it's marketable and also to actually market it. We'll come in and we'll develop the whole system for a cut of the revenue on the book that you develop. Right. Either you pay the subscription fee, you get something simple, it's useful, it could make a lot of cool stuff. Or if you want, you know, subscribe to the next level and maybe you actually pay a little bit more. But there's some sort of licensing deal with the company where as they try to market it and recent release and publish it, you as the person who's on board with the software can create synergy with the company. It sounds like what you're describing the latter model is the traditional publishing industry, right? They do the, the marketing, the publishing, everything for you. What, yeah. What's different about it? Well, I, I, basically what I'm saying is we were discussing, do we want it to just write books and try to publish them? And I think we're not at the level, like you said, Chris, you, you sampled a couple things and you read it and you're like, I don't know that I would buy this. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't think we're at the level today where we can really create long form content that people are going to flock to read. And so we do need the help of creative individuals 
but we might not need as help as much help as you would think. So if you did want to get into the publishing side of things, there's a few differences. One is this is AI based generated content, right? Like your, your, your foundational aspect is that you're helping to, you're creating AI based generated content. You're, you're leveraging AI to help create the content. And the cool aspect is if you're already in that field, AI is, you know, a hammer to a lot of different nails. And if you've already got people on your team that are, you know, expert in the application of that and know how to use it, you can say, oh, well, we can be this sort of like add AI to every piece of the, the publishing industry from marketing to sales to, you know, crafting to editing and all this stuff. And you could really have a leg up on a lot of competition. I'm curious. I, I like that idea. I'm curious if where you start is just by establishing a publishing house and in as you're going through your values and your mission you reference utilizing technology and so that becomes a part of your company culture so that as these technologies do become viable you're already thinking about how they can be integrated even that is going to give you a leg up on the competition, it's going to, being a startup, you're going to be nimble and agile, and you're going to be able to adopt these technologies that the big five publishing houses just don't, they can't turn the ship that quickly. That is an interesting and straightforward um, point. Just like opportunity is that these, the, the big five are doing things the old way, and they're going to be very slow to adopt new technologies that we all know are coming. Just start your publishing house with those new technologies in mind. It's well said. I'm thinking of an even smaller scale version of starting as Ethan was sharing his two examples. The first, the first part that stuck out to me is helping authors kickstart their writing. One big pain point for writers is writer's block. And even if you had a subscription service that helped, uh, helped you get over writer's block faster, every day when you sit down on your computer and you start to write, will spit out 10 different versions of something that you can start with. And yeah, you reduce the amount of time that it takes you to write by 50% because you don't have to grapple with writer's block for hours. That's really good. I think too, like, uh, how do you get ideas? Where do your ideas come from? I think if you, you know, SEO and keyword research is a skill. It's a specialty. There are people that that's their entire job day in and day out is to do just that. And so even a, a service or a house that would work with authors to provide them with ideas. And then I really like your licensing model, um, which functionally is a royalty, right? Except Ethan, in your model, does the publishing house make the money and then pay out the author? Or does the author make the money and then the publishing house takes a cut. Who gets a bigger slice? I mean, I think I think when it comes down to it, all right, well, let me say this first. I want to go back to your idea of having a have it being a mission-driven thing, you know. Make one of your mission goals for to make it ethical, you know, to make it uh tasteful, you know, to make it fun and to make it culturally enriching, right? Like we, we don't want to do this if it's just, you know, profit motive and degenerate. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that could be a cool center. And I think you could still be quite successful if you had a mission driven, maybe even more successful, right? Because because a lot more people could be on board and everybody feel good about what they're doing. So put that in front of your question. And then part of it is just what will the market bear? You know, I mean, you could think about ethics, you could think about taking care of artists and artisans. I think that's really important. Um, but also you need to think about making sure you create a business that can sustain itself, right? So sure. you have to put the sustainability of the business in front of, you know, paying out authors and so on and so forth. Otherwise the business just won't exist anymore. But I would say to answer your question, I think you're going to go with a traditional model where as the publisher, you are collecting the revenues and distributing them. You could give advance, you could even give advances to authors based on, applications, you know, and you could even have AI, you know, vetted application reviews, you know, a, a lot of there's, I know there, I was reading in, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell's book about strangers, you know, he's talking about how we, how we, I don't know how we judge strangers, right? And he was saying that judges 
have a tendency to be lenient with criminals that they shouldn't be. <laughs> um, and it's because they get a chance to meet them and see them and then they become biased by the interactions and the personalities that they have. Because you could imagine like somebody who's kind of a hustler and they're kind of like, they can kind of scam people. They actually might also be able to kind of scam and trick a judge or something a little bit with their personality. And so they found, I believe in the book that if you just took like a measure of various factors that you could measure numerically and compare that you'd actually do a better job of putting the right people in jail. Point being, you could use AI even in doing this where you could decide who might get an advance, right? Because advances are something that happened in the publishing industry. And you can say, okay, well, this particular model, this particular subset of the clients we work with, you'll get a $50,000 or $100,000 or whatever advance. And the way I'm, I'm pretty sure it still works in the publishing industry is you have to kind of pay that back from the sales of the book and then you get to start to make royalties, right? Do you know how many uh, pay back their advances? Oh, I bet you it's a small percentage, right? I would say I'm going to guess like 10%. I, you know, it wasn't a fair question because I don't know the answer. But <laughs> I do know from my conversations with uh, my old editor that, yeah, it's not that many. And so... The publishing industry is a gamble. I, I remember asking him, like, what, what is it? What are you looking for? And he has bought books that, you know, he, he had a 50-year career in publishing. And that makes him more inclined to sniff out good books and books that will be commercially viable and that will support the business than somebody who's just starting out or someone with no experience. But it's a it's a gamble. And so, yeah, can you use AI to uh, sort through that? Could you put, could you figure out, use AI to figure out a topic where there is a lot of organic query on Amazon, not a lot of resources or poor quality resources, have the AI tell you what those topics are, develop titles around those topics, put out an application process for writers who are interested in publishing through your house, let an, another AI, another algorithm vet those applications, figure out who is going to produce the most sustainable work, figure out how much it should pay them based on you know what the market is doing and, and what the topic is and where the, the search volume is. That is all something that could be done right now. I completely agree. Yeah. I don't want to be too like insensitive about it, but I am a creative person. So I've had to deal with this myself. You know, reality sure. is reality. Life is life. Some people have popular books. Some people don't. And I, I, I had this idea for call it a business model or an economic model, and I'm pretty sure it would never work. Right. So I was friends with people who are a group of authors, right? And they would all agree that, oh, we're all really great authors and we all deserve to get like a million dollar book deal or whatever, right? And even when one of them would, right? Like somebody would get like the success, you know, the person who got the million dollar book deal would be like, no, but you're a better author. You should have got that. You know, I'm, I'm you know, I, I can't, I don't deserve this, whatever. They go through all the, I don't know what you would call it, the formalities of that. And there was this kind of idea floating around, like how unfair it is. The publishing industry is just where you have some people get a big hit and other people don't. Okay. Well, if you think that's unfair, right? I think all these people are great authors and they all should be equally compensated. Why not form a collective where everybody just writes, right? And um, you all uh, publish your content. And instead of the one person whose book gets most popular, everybody just get paid out evenly from the most popular book. <laughs> Nobody would sign up for that, right? Because people a want single person. the motivation <laughs> for being an author is to, you know, have the like, I, mine worked. And it wouldn't, it probably wouldn't be as fulfilling if you didn't actually get to benefit economically from, uh, from your book that did well. Now, I would argue that it actually probably would be a good model. Like it would be a good model because it would make life sustainable for those artists. But I think people's mm. sort of egos and desire to hit it big wouldn't uh, make it a viable model. That That's a fascinating thought experiment. And it reminds me, one of my favorite thought experiments comes from a philosopher named John Rawls. 
and it's called the veil of ignorance. And he says, not in this exact wording, but, but functionally, if you could be born to any member of your community under a veil of ignorance, meaning that you could be born yourself, yay, or you could be born the poorest member of your community, or you could be born the richest member of your community or, or the most well-off, however you define that, uh, would you choose under the veil of ignorance to participate in that community? And if you can say yes, that is a just community. Um, and so nobody would say yes. I wouldn't say yes to, to any community I've ever lived in in my life, right? And I think that um, it might mean that that society isn't just, uh, or it might mean that you are playing the wrong game. Uh, and I think that's what I'm bringing it back to my buddy, JB, Josiah Bancroft. I think that's what he realized. He was he was playing the wrong game. I remember being at a, a beer festival that I was throwing and I was in the break room. We set up a little room for all the brewers who want to you know, rest their feet and grab a cold drink or something. And I remember hearing a brewer lamenting that they just wanted to brew lagers, which are a very difficult, very technically challenging style of beer to brew. But all people were buying in their tap room was, you know, the crazy IPAs and fruited sours and super dessert stouts. And I think you can lament that. And it's fine to do that with your friends because you just need to get it off your chest. But it's also just the way it is. And so you can lament it. They call it, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a book, uh, by the founders of, uh, a course in the Stanford design school. I think it's called life design or something like that. And they call mm -hmm. this type of thing, a gravity problem. So it's mm -hmm. like, you can complain about problems like gravity, like, Oh, when I throw this up, it comes down to the earth. Ah, oh, that sucks. I wanted it to keep going, but you can't fix them. Right. And so like, you can't, you shouldn't probably spend too much energy trying to change the, the gravity problems. And, and I think you're right on that one. I will say this. And uh, because my computer's running slow today, I can't look up these type of links. But there is a cool project for entrepreneurs. It's very applicable to, to this. And I think if you looked it up, I think it might be a Scandinavian project uh, where it's kind of like business insurance, like it's entrepreneurial insurance kind of thing where you can join it and you can pay a monthly fee. And basically the mission of the organization is to provide some sort of like a cushion for everybody that's involved that's working on entrepreneurial projects. Like if it's a failure or, you know, if you, so you can keep, having some means to keep going and keep trying new things, it builds like a safety network for it. And I believe that's actually working. So I, I think there, there's room for models like this, I believe. It also has very little to do with AI, but, <laughs> but you still have, I, yeah, you have to have I, a bar that's, that's high enough to make sure that the people who are joining that are not just going to sit on their hands. It goes without saying, and I'm sure you're not advocating that People are going to just join in and they'll say, oh, I can just write whatever I want today or you know, who, who cares what I end up producing because I'm going to get part of Ethan's cut. And this is probably the reason that people inherently know this. They intuitively know that or believe that other people are going to be lazy about it if they know that they can reap some of the rewards of the people who are working really hard. So I, one, one thing I wanted to come, I wanted to uh, layer on to... Uh, the model that we suggested here of using AI to generate content ideas, giving those content ideas out to the world, having people submit, you know, write their own content and have different AI analyze it and pick a winner and say, okay, you're the one who's going to write this book. The gap that I think uh, that addresses, there's one gap that addresses in the selection of writers. Another opportunity would be in helping those writers actually succeed. It seems like right now, authors, fiction authors are on an island of sorts where they're, they're writing. Sure, they have an editor, but they're not getting as much direction as you could probably get from a publishing house. And if you were using AI to help them in that creative process, maybe it's just helping them write faster. Maybe it's helping them actually with topics or uh, ideas, plot points, whatever, then I think you have a real advantage. It reminds me of 
the business model of Shopify itself, strangely enough. Toby Luca will say that they help create entrepreneurs. That's the entire goal for it. And they reduce friction for entrepreneurship. If you can reduce friction for people to become good authors, you are going to make a lot of money. I like that. That's a great spirit for this kind of project. And I think, you know, just going back to the ethical question, if you want to write, nobody's stopping you. You can write to your heart's content. I think what you have to ask yourself is, do I want to write or do I want people to read my writing? Do I want people to pay for my writing? Do I want to, do I want a hobby or do I want a, a livelihood? And I think if your answer to any of those questions is the latter, this is where you should be looking because this is the future. Well said. We are well over time here, <laughs> Kenny. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about related to this idea that we didn't get to? Uh, a little, actually. So I uh, am putting out some books coming down the line here that I did want to mention. Um, it's a lot of very cool stuff for entrepreneurs about how to run better businesses. It's something I know a lot about having run and sold a business myself very recently. Um, if you want to stay up to date on those resources, you can find me on Instagram at hopcultureken, like pop culture, but with an H and Ken, like Kenny, my name, uh, or Kenny Gould, G-O-U-L-D dot com. Just started a monthly email newsletter, which is filled with all sorts of fun updates and resources on the different projects I'm working on. And you can subscribe for free to that from my website. Oh, the first email actually just went out right now. I uh, had it on a schedule. I just saw it pop up. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that I do have a, a book out right now, uh, The Brewing Cloud. It's fiction, uh, short stories, and you can find it on Amazon by looking up me, Kenny Gould, or The Brewing Cloud. Yeah, Kenny, man, it's been fun chatting with you. I enjoy diving into this topic and hearing your insights here. And yeah, looking forward to, to catch up with you again in the future. Sounds good. Thank you both. 